Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's fantastic to be given this opportunity to speak to you from uh, the cold north of Scotland, where we have rain and cloud and shower um, and uh, nothing like the sunshine of Kerala, where I remember having my 60th birthday um, in a wonderful hotel on the coast, uh, which was a very, very special event for me. And uh, the journeys through your wonderful uh, canals and the beautiful landscape. So returning now to uh, the topic for today, um, I've been asked to talk about a subject that has been dear to my heart for many, many years, uh, because I started identifying and helping children with impairment of vision due to injury or damage to the brain, cerebral visual impairment, um, in the late 1980s, and uh, finding that the literature about this topic was available from 1918. Um, and so I've always been captured by this subject, and uh, that's what I've been asked to talk about to you today. So um, would you like me to share the screen now? Yes, sir. Fine. So sharing the screen, um, I'm just finding my talk um, and sharing it with you. So here's the title, Cerebral or Cortical Visual Impairment, or CVI, in Children, The Impact on Learning and Education. Medically, cerebral visual impairment has become an overarching term, referring to the range of visual and perceptual visual impairments due to dysfunction, anomaly, or injury to the brain. Politically and financially, opinions may well differ, but in the ideal world, this should not limit precise medical diagnosis, nor should it limit the delivery of optimum care for affected children. The basis for this talk is the range of outcomes of focal visual brain injury, considering the six classical questions of who, where, when, what, how, and why? So who are the affected children? Well, they are a large proportion of those with periventricular white matter pathology, as shown in this picture. And an even larger proportion of children who sadly have developed hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, often around the time of birth. And then it's about 50% of children uh, with shunted hydrocephalus have been found to have perceptual visual problems with acquired hemorrhagic brain injury, such as here in which the hemorrhages were in the posterior parietal lobes, as you can see above the, uh, the cerebellum. And by the way, each of these children actually had binocular visual acuities of 6, 12 or even better. It includes many with who have had non-accidental injury, many with retinopathy of prematurity, so that every child with non-accidental injury and retinopathy of prematurity should be followed up for cerebral visual impairment because the brain is equally likely to be affected. And many with disc cupping, you may ask? Yes, because uh, they can have homonymous lower visual field impairment, and the lesion is that the visual field defects in prematurely born patients with white matter damage of immaturity, a multiple case study by Lena Jakobsen in 2006. This paper shows that it's retrograde transsynaptic degeneration back into the eyes, which gives rise to this cupping. So when you see cupping, the first thing to think about in a child is cerebral visual uh, impairment. And more recently, they have found retinal nerve fiber changes imaged by OCT, the same team, in their paper entitled Damage to the Immature Optic Radiation Causes Severe Reduction of the Retinal Nerve Fiber Layer Resulting in Predictable Visual Field Defects. The title is the statement of the findings of the paper. And then 
We've seen CVI due to teratogenesis, such as in toxoplasmosis, in congenital anomalies, such as in lysencephaly and other congenital brain anomalies, occipital encephalocele, of course. Uh, and like the 12% of children with cerebral palsy, CVI can in some cases be accompanied by normal imaging. Moreover, a large proportion of children with cerebral palsy, it's over 80%, have visual and visuomotor disorders due to cerebral visual impairment. We move our bodies through the picture formed in our heads. And then there's a group uh, by, shown by Kathy Williams and colleagues who've described uh, visual perceptual difficulties and underachievement at school in a large community uh, based sample of over four and a half thousand children. And more recently, they have found that this 3.5% of children in the United Kingdom are estimated to have cerebral visual impairment, which is one child in every classroom. It may well be exactly the same in Kerala with features consistent with dorsal stream dysfunction being described in almost 0.7%. So where in the brain is their dysfunction or their pathology? Of course, we're aware of this classical model of the visual system of the picture being formed in the eye and being transported via the lateral geniculate body to the occipital lobes, but the vision-related brain comprises about 40% of cerebral tissue at a conservative estimate, which means that brain injury is very, very likely to cause visual difficulties. But if we don't look for them, we won't necessarily find them. The occipital lobes are well known to analyze incoming visual information with respect to visual field and acuity, contrast and color, while the pulvina of the thalamus and the superior tectal area serve uh, an attentional reflex vision, which when injured tend to render the CVI more profound. And then there's the middle temporal motion area of the brain, which processes both reflex and conscious perception of motion, which means that this is a function that may be either retained as blind sight in somebody who's got an occipital infarction, but because the middle temporal lobe can be supplied by the middle cerebral artery, this can be spared, or it can be impaired if the middle temporal lobes are affected, causing impaired perception of movement or dyskinetopsia. Then we have the ventral stream, the ventral stream or the what pathway leading from the occipital lobes to the temporal lobes, which provide the mental image library for visual learning, recognition, imagination and dreams, and of course, uh, formed visual hallucinations bringing about recognition of objects. Um, and each object on this screen uh, is re instantly recognized because it has been filed by prior experience within the temporal lobes uh, of our brain. And a recognition of faces and facial expressions largely filed in the fusiform gyrus, largely of the right temporal lobe of most people. But such skills can be lost or diminished with temporal lobe injury or dysfunction, as can recognition of locations and roots. And then we have the dorsal stream or where pathway uh, and uh, going from the occipital lobes to the posterior parietal lobes which creates the real-time, non-conscious, 3D mental emulation of our surroundings that guides our movements, a bit like an architectural plan, but without vision, upon which it, giving it a framework for the conscious visual scene created in the temporal lobes to be mapped both with respect to oneself, egocentrically, and, and with respect to one's body, and respect to the uh, other people allocentrically so we can judge what other people are going to do. This crowded scene is difficult for a child with dorsal stream dysfunction as it is for us, as it is impossible to analyze and is mentally overwhelming, as even we are experiencing now. Try and see an element in this scene. Dorsal stream vision non-consciously guides our movements, whether it is reaching and grasping or running down the stairs, 
But when it is impaired, inaccurate reach and impairment of visual guidance of the lower limbs and body or optic ataxia results because we, are, we have an inaccurate mental map through which to move. So to recap, the mind assimilates the incoming static and moving visual information, non-consciously mapping it in the posterior parietal lobes as a real-time 3D construct. The incoming conscious image data are compared with the temporal lobe data banks for recognition or for new learning and are integrated with the information from all our senses to provide our mapped reality. So the significance? Well, into the occipital lobes and their input, the incoming data are degraded or lost. So you have reduced acuity or visual fields or contrast sensitivity or color vision. Into the middle temporal lobes, only slow movement or rarely no movement can be seen into the posterior parietal lobes or their input, and the dynamic mapping of the scene is degraded for visual search and for motor guidance. And into the temporal lobes, of course, recognition is then impaired. These outcomes can occur in any combination or degree, giving each affected child their own unique normal visual reality, which we need to profile to be able to help them. And when does such pathology arise? At any time. If it's prenatal, it could be periventricular pathology, perinatal, neonatal hypoglycemia, postnatal, non-accidental injury, and any time thereafter. For example, cardiac complications of cardiac surgery. But with late but not early onset pathology, useful skills have been learned with prior vision, which means that one has to give rehabilitation to use those prior skills with acquired pathology, but habilitation to bring about the ability to gain new skills uh, with congenital or, near, or pathology around the time of birth. And what are the features that give the diagnosis? Well, there's the initial volunteered visual history is very informative. We found that CVI is to be likely if difficulties with three or more of walking downstairs for visual reasons, seeing things that move quickly, such as small animals, seeing something that is pointed out in the distance despite the requisite acuity, or difficulty locating an item of clothing in a pile, or copying words or pictures. So three or more out of these five entities, if are difficult, that makes perceptual visual impairment highly likely. So what are the features that give this diagnosis? There's also standard examination of refraction, visual function and structure, as well as eye movements needs to be carried out, including assessment of accommodation. Customized examination needs to be carried out to match the history because you can't do all the tests for everything. It's the history which guides the uh, protocol of examination, which is different for every affected child, such as seeing an extended foot in a child who trips, where extrapolation of the line between the eyes looking ahead and where the foot is first seen when being extended gives a useful estimate to the extent of the unseen ground ahead. And then watching visual guidance of the reaching hand in the lower and the upper visual fields um, is really worthwhile. So that a normal grasp is shown in A, a wide grasp is shown in B, which and a hand on top in C or gathering up, B, C and D are progressively more obvious forms of optic ataxia, because as you can see, these are compensatory strategies. If you would now just reach to the side for something uh, whilst looking straight ahead and you will find that you adopt exactly the same strategies without ever realizing that that is normal for peripheral vision for all of us. So B, C and D showing increasing degrees of optic ataxia. <coughs> Excuse me. Counting fingers on a moving hand as it is gradually slowed down 
uh, through subjective, although subjective, can identify this kind of topsia in the clinic. So, for example, if I move my hand and then show three fingers um, and then gradually slow down, you will see them because you had cerebral visual impairment with dyskinetopsia uh, because uh, this, of the screen refresh rate is slow. And then there's Leo Huvarinen's extensive range of tests. For example, uh, the rectangles game seeks the child's ability to judge spacing, orientation and length, as well as reaching and grasping. And then salient imaging, of course, may well be needed. And as I've said, uh, this could include uh, imaging of the retina, as well as identifying the underlying pathogenesis. That leads on to how are the uh, features pieced together? Well, there are many patterns. Here are some examples. Anna was eight when her arteriovenous malformation bled into her right occipital lobe while Emily was five when her arteriovenous malformation bled into her right posterior parietal lobe. Of course, these are rare, but they are focal pathologies which we can use to understand what is going on. So, as you would expect, as shown in A, B and C, in A, um, she's looking straight ahead, in B, she's looking to the side and seeing the white disc, and in C, she's moving her body to the left, but cannot see the white disc. Um, so hers is a hemianopia due to her occipital pathology. But for Emily, D, E and F show her attentional loss relating to her body, which is not compensated for by the head turn shown in E, but is compensated for by the body turn shown in F. So inattention hemianopia is actually changes as the body turns, even though the head is pointing straight ahead. And if one were to do this, and I've done it uh, in the visual fields equipment, it's amazing the visual field moves um, and therefore you know it's inattentional, not something that's ever been done or well published in the literature. So because unlike the occipital lobes, which map the scene with respect to the head and the eyes, the parietal lobes map the scene in relation to the body. Of course it does, because they pass it to the motor cortex, which has to be correctly mapped to the body. And in some children, the picture can be mixed because they can have dual pathology and therefore they need both a head turn and a body turn to be able to identify things on the hemianopic or hemianotentional side. Emma was 18 when she sustained a stroke in her right temporal lobe, causing left upper quadrant visual field loss and inability to recognize faces due to infarction of her fusiform or spindle-shaped gyrus of the right temporal lobe, causing her prosopagnosia, shown in this picture here, not being able to recognize faces with a lesion in that part of the brain. She also lost her way owing to her combined topographic agnosia. Have you noticed that when you go to a new place or you meet somebody in a different different place when you usually see them you may not recognize them because faces and places are co-filed in the fusiform gyrus of the right temporal lobe. These are of course ventral stream dysfunctions. Anne was 16 when she had a cardiac arrest. She woke in ICU with no vision. Her MRI showed cerebral edema and she had a gradual recovery. Her visual acuity was 2040 with a wide field, but she woke unable to recognize people or objects unless they occupied much of the visual field so that a cup and a jug or a watch and a bracelet appeared the same, but beds and cupboards were easily identified, which suggests, if you like, that there is a kind of acuity for object size in the ventral stream, but this has never been reported in the literature. It's a, just a case that I've seen. Eight-year-old Kirsty's was another missed diagnosis. She had a term birth with the cord around her neck. As a toddler, she tripped. Her vision was 2060. She had absent lower visual fields. She misreached. She could not see more than three items at once, but both have simultanagnosia, in which only the central attentional field was clear, like this face within the rest of the scene. Chris and Kirsty's 
patterns comprised bilateral posterior parietal injury with lower visual field loss and dorsal stream dysfunction characterized by simultanagnostic visual difficulties and optic ataxia, as well as disability moving the eyes to a nominated target or apraxia of gaze. This picture is akin to Balint syndrome at the worst end of the spectrum of dorsal stream dysfunction. This varied range and severity of visual difficulties is by far the commonest pattern of visual impairment related to brain pathology or dysfunction that we've seen over the last 25 years. But if you don't look for it, you'll never find it because the affected children know themselves to be normal. So one has to listen to the behaviours and the adaptive behaviours described by the parents. As an aside, as I've mentioned, Gordon Holmes in 1918 described the same condition in six First World War soldiers with shrapnel injuries. This soldier, Sergeant K, aged 33, had no lower visual fields. He could not see moving objects. He searched slowly and awkwardly due to his simultanagnosia and was unable to reach out accurately due to his optic ataxia, despite good visual acuities and good stereopsis. And the lesion in his brain is shown uh, in this 1918 uh, illustration. But there are many more patterns, such as low acuity and contrast sensitivity being affected alone, homonymous paracentral visual field loss, alexia without agraphia or dejarine syndrome, in which you can read, but you, uh, or, and, which you can't read, but you can write, but you can't read what you've written, um, or focal impairment of recognition, like literal alexia, not being able to read individual specific letters, which I've seen in viral encephalitis in children, to name a few not even including the visual impact of associated eye movement disorders. And many behaviours that result uh, can be adaptive, such as getting close to the TV to limit what is seen, if your parents will let you, or reactive, such as becoming fearful, angry or subdued in crowds. Just imagine what approaching people look like when you can't, non-consciously, work out where they are in motoric depth. It can be terrifying. We've called this looming on our CVI Scotland website, uh, information uh, website for parents and teachers, or it can be absent because of lack of vision. So how does the paediatric ophthalmologist diagnose cerebral visual impairment and why? We come to the next question. Why do we need to identify and characterize those affected? Well, in a line, one cannot learn from what one cannot see and therefore uh, developmentally and educationally affected children have considerable difficulties learning. And therefore we need to know what they can see in order to ensure that they do not miss out on their education. Children can only learn from what they can perceive. They cannot learn from what they do not see. That's obvious. Vision facilitates three key functions, mobility, access to information in all its forms. Um, I can see shoes, I can see hats, I can see uh, uh, reflection in the pond, I can see uh, a red shirt, a blue shirt, many, many words to, but if you don't know what they are because you do not see them, how can you learn words that other people use to refer to what you do not see? That means language has to change. And that is part of communication and social communication. How can you respond to a smile that is invisible? And children need to learn all these skills. So what do children with CVI need to help them learn to develop, to thrive and to succeed? They need their parents and teachers to understand their vision, to ensure that everything a child learns from is accessible. So diagnosis has to lead on to a change into rehabilitation or habilitation with comprehensive profiling of all limits so as to work within them and all abilities to bring about matched wide ranging adaptations, alternative approaches to parenting and education and accessible training. In many ways, CVI is not so much a diagnosis as a lifelong state of alternative normality that needs to be recognized and understood. And this condition is evolving into a subspecialty in its own right, requiring the requisite knowledge and expertise to profile, diagnose and characterize each child as each child's CVI is unique. 
needing good teamwork, good communication and good teaching skills. CVI is a hidden disability. Diagnosis requires a fully informed mind, a primary mindset of suspicion, a secondary mindset for confirmation and a tertiary mindset for characterization. Every child with visual impairment deserves and benefits from identification, characterization, good information, full understanding and optimally enhanced parenting and education. And it is our duty to ensure that this happens. As a summary of this lecture, this slide of the tree of vision allows this scene to come in from the bottom into the roots of the tree with the left and right eyes, up through the optic nerves and visual pathways, taking into account the reflex vision in the upper midbrain, the supraecolicular and the pulvina, and through the lateral genicular bodies, the optic radiations, the occipital lobes, and then into the ventral stream, serving the naming of colours, recognising words, letters and numbers, objects and shapes, recognising animals, and conscious recognition of people, recognizing facial expressions and the innate ability to root find. Whereas at the dorsal stream, that is required for finding root finding in crowded scenes, finding a person in a group of people, spotting a distant target, finding clothes in a pile or objects in clutter, an object on the pattern background or crowding of text, all of which can be impaired in any combination or permutation, which is why we have to ask about all of them uh, in a child with cerebral visual impairment. It can also affect visual guidance of movements of the arms, the hands, the legs, the feet and the body. And of course, racket skills, ball skills and everything like that. So in essence, cerebral visual impairment is a huge subject. And I've tried to summarize what should normally take around about a three month course in 20 minutes. Thank you.